Historian and biographer Charlotte Gray has been uncovering the remarkable in Canadian history for the better part of two decades. Her new book, Just in Time for the Country's Sesquicentennial, offers a sweeping look at the nation as a work in progress. It's called The Promise of Canada, 150 Years, People and Ideas that Have Shaped Our Country. And Charlotte Gray joins us now for more. It's delightful to have you back here in our studio. Great to be here, Steve. Since we were, had you here last for the Massey murder, and now here you are back again. You, uh, as people will know, uh, from the moment you opened your mouth, you weren't born here. You've got a little bit of that accent still. You came here as an adult in 1979. What was your sense of Canada three and a half decades ago? I was so surprised when I got here because, you know, outsiders all my lifetime have thought Canada is this sort of coherent, solid country in the north, northern half of North America, not as noisy as the States, you know, more British influences, but nevertheless, a Canadian identity existed. When I got here in 1979, I discovered Canada in the middle of a national unity crisis and everybody saying, is it going to fall apart? And I thought, wait a minute, what's the national glue? What's keeping this country together? How could it possibly fall apart? And it was like, you know, the closer you got to Canada, the more diffuse and the harder it was to identify. Did you ever figure out what that glue was? I discovered that, in fact, in Canada, every generation re reinvents the country. Hmm. And as a result, you have taken the approach of looking at different figures through our history to tell part of the country's story. Um, that's a different approach, obviously, from 1867, we had Confederation, 1871, the Manuscu, whatever, whatever. Why this approach? You know, Canadians actually are not great on learning our history. We're not ter terrifically proud of it. It doesn't seem to have a lot in it. And it's really a hard sell if you ever tell anybody you're writing history. But we all love biography. We all love finding out sort of what it was like to actually be back then, to live there. What was it like to uh, be a farmer's wife on the prairies in uh, the 1890s? What was it like to be an artist? What was it like to be a writer in Toronto in the 1960s? And so if you take people in through a biographical doorway into our history. I find that sort of readers get quite excited then because they can actually see what life was like and understand how somebody growing up, you know, whether it's Tommy Douglas arriving in Winnipeg in 1919 uh, and what he saw then and all the influences on him then, how it actually persuaded him that uh, an interventionist government was good for Canada. Hmm. Here's a quote from the book. Canada slipped quietly into the world the cliché about the mild-mannered Canadian is rooted in the Dominion's birth. The 1864 Charlottetown Conference seemed little more than a sketchy real estate deal. A highlight of the conference was a ball at Prince Edward Island's government house. Confederation was a defensive strategy then, not an epic dream of nationhood. A bunch of impoverished, underpopulated, raw-boned and rough-mannered British colonies came together, not for a group hug, but because their leaders foresaw unpleasant alternatives. Tell us about those unpleasant alternatives. What are you thinking of there? There were two alternatives to Canada becoming an independent or an aut autonomous dominion. One was staying close to Britain, but that wasn't going to happen because, in fact, the British were getting fed up of their British North American colonies. They were getting tired of pouring money into the militias to defend them. And they were trying to cut the ties. All they could see across the Atlantic were these British colonies saying, we want more money, we come and look after us, we want more help. At the same time, the United States was just coming out of an incredibly bloody civil war. And it was just sort of emerging as a real powerhouse. And many of the pr politicians in Washington were casting very hungry eyes north. And uh, assuming that once the British had cut Canada or the, the colonies in British North America loose, it would just fall like ripe plums mm. into, into the American embrace. And the leading politicians of the time didn't want that. They could see that, in fact, this country, the, these colonies could make one confederation. So we had a four-province group hug at the time. We did end up with a four-province group hug, although none of the provinces particularly liked each other. <laughs> but they were smart enough to come up with a government structure that allowed them to not exactly hug, but at least hold hands. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess it's conventional wisdom that most great countries start through cataclysmic or revolution. 
We didn't. No. And yet here we are. We've had a, a very... As one book once said, uh, was, was, there's a famous book called The Peaceable Kingdom. This, this was a very sort of quiet birth, mm. the uh, birth of the Dominion of Canada in 1867. So it means there isn't the sort of drama of Gettysburg or the... Um, I would, was brought up on, you know, the Norman conquest of Britain. I was, I was brought up on sort of wonderful bloody tales of British history. And if you think about uh, what happened in China with the Great March or... Or every country that I studied in university, in fact, had had incredibly bloody births. Mm. But we never studied Canada. Because <laughs> we didn't have one. There was, yet... there was really sort of nothing terribly dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, well, here's something that's somewhat dramatic. And obviously, if you're going to pick nine people through whom to tell the story of a country, you're going to run into fights somewhere along the way because people are going to think, why would you pick this one instead of this one? So let's get into that right away. Your first guy is Georges Etienne Cartier. Not Sir Johnny MacDonald. Now, that's an odd choice for a lot of people, I think. So why him? Two reasons. The first was that I decided I was going to do the biographical approach, but I was not going to do a single prime minister because the prime ministers, the best ones, have had wonderful biographers. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, sometimes it's not the guy with the, uh, the charisma and the ability to, wa to win elections that is going to seep into the national psyche the, the really important ideas. It's the thinker or the lieutenant or whatever yeah. who's actually sort of thought about the structural problems that uh, are going to arise. Why I chose Cartier was, yes, John A. Macdonald had the vision of Canada, but, in fact, his vision was that it would be one country with one central government, just like uh, Britain had, and uh, he would really have actually trampled over the rights of the different communities. Whereas Cartier realized that, in fact, a federal system where there was one federal government and then each of the old colonies, which became provinces, had their own government, that, that would allow, in his case, the most important for him, the, the community of uh, the French Canadians, what we call now the Quebecois, uh, they would be able to keep their language, their customs, their legal system, and maintain a sense of themselves as an independent nation. Was he as essential to Confederation as MacDonald, in your view? He was more essential. He was more essential because he had that idea, and he was only going to agree to Confederation if that idea was incorporated into uh, the new country. And if MacDonald had said no, he would have lost Cartier, and he would have lost all Cartier's votes. Uh, all these uh, MPs who supported Cartier. So it wouldn't have happened without right. him. Right. No Cartier, no Quebec, no, Can no Quebec, no Canada. Exactly. Hmm. Here's another excerpt from the book. There was a further challenge for the wily Montreal lawyer, talking about Cartier. He had to sell the deal to his fellow French-speaking Canadians in what would soon be called Quebec. He had to persuade them that Confederation was the key to the preservation of their unique identity, not the first step in its gradual dissolution. He distinguished between political and cultural nationality, arguing that the establishment of a federal government will strengthen the culture that is dear to us. The federal government is the only system in which the survival of French Canada will be secure. You know, 150 years later, we're still debating this, right? Because there's obviously nationalists in Quebec who, who don't think it is. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So what do you see? I see a province, Quebec, which in fact is now a very modern, for, forward-looking province. It's gone through, during the last 150 years, this extraordinary cultural revolution. And as we mentioned earlier, when I arrived, it looked like Quebec might actually just walk away from Confederation. It hasn't. The national unity crisis, the, the uh, separatist crisis, has simmered right down. Young Quebecers, it's a very low priority for them. They, they think in global terms. And um, federalism worked. Okay, let's go through the rest of your list. We're going to be, because he was such a big deal, we spend a little more time with him. We'll go a little more briskly through the rest. Samuel Steele is on your list. Who's he? The Mounties. Now, Sam Steele is an absolute quintessential Canadian symbol. Look, the red tunic. Good-looking good guy. He, he Isn't just, he great? Just had a picture of him up. Yeah. The, he, he was the tough, barrel-chested Mountie from the Northwest Mounted Police who rode out west, and then, in fact, during the gold rush in the 1890s, went up to the Yukon and kept peace. And, you know, the mountains have become the most incredible symbol now for Canada. Every 
country recognizes uh, that character in the red tunic. And when you become a Canadian, as I did, in a citizenship uh, uh, ceremony, there's always a Mountie there. And even though when I became a citizen, there was nobody else in the room that, uh, whose first language was English, but we all knew who the mm. Mountie was. And Sam, was, Sam very quickly became the Mountie everybody recognized. You chose an artist, Emily Carr, as a key shaper of this nation. How come? She understood the importance of landscape. She understood that this sort of vast and wonderful landscape, that we could never own it. She acknowledged that there had been um, indigenous residents before, we, before the settlers arrived, uh, which is more than the group of seven ever did. And she managed to capture the menace and the magnificence of the extraordinary expanse of Canada. Hmm. Many people know Innes College in downtown Toronto as part of the University of Toronto. They don't know Harold Innes, after whom it is named. Who is Harold Innes? Harold Innes, great uh, historian and economist, uh, an academic. He was forged, his view of Canada was forged during the First World War when he was, a, he was wounded in the trenches. And, but more than that, he was so offended by the way that the British officers in the Allied Army treated Canadians and colonials, that he came back to Canada after the First World War and decided that this country must design its own future. It couldn't just hang on to the apron strings of the, the motherland, as Britain was called. Now, if you're going to pick a professor from the University of Toronto who, I mean, there was another guy there who was even more famous than Harold Innes, and that's Marshall McLuhan. How come you didn't pick him? I thought very hard about picking Marshall McLuhan, but in fact, I was, all nine of the people that I picked had very strong views about Canada. Marshall McLuhan went way beyond Canada. He was much more interested in new media. He wasn't, it, he could have actually been in any university in any English speaking country in the world. Innes could only belong to Canada. And his great statement on Canada was, Canada is a country because of its geography, not in spite of it. Hmm, okay. I think I'm sold on that. I think that makes sense. Tommy Douglas, I'm not surprised to see him on your list. Obviously, the father of Medicare, former Saskatchewan Premier. You know, if you're not from Canada, though, you may look and say, now, why would... All Tommy Douglas did was figure out a way for, you know, people to see doctors without going bankrupt and doctors to make sure they get paid without uh, having bills go awry. So how come he's on your list? Because of exactly what you said, he introduced Medicare. But more than that, you know, there was a big change around particularly after the Second World War, where Canadians began to see that government could be a force of benevolence, that we could, that government, an interventionist government could improve people's lives. That's a huge difference between Canada and the US. It's a very significant cleavage. And uh, I think Tommy really was sort of the first person to push that idea into the national discourse. Mm. And they're still fighting about it down south, right? They are. The Obama, Obamacare, they're still fighting about it. You went back to the arts with the next choice, Margaret Atwood, obviously perhaps our most ever famous author, and therefore on your list for that reason? Yes, because she really helped found CanLit. She really helped um, Canadian writers, and then by inference, other artists, uh, musicians and uh, painters and sculptors, to understand that uh, this country had its own psyche and that deserved to be reflected. But more than that, more than those brilliant early novels, which were horror gasp set in Toronto, which no American publisher ever wanted to have a novel set in Toronto, um, she also plays, played such an, a hugely important part in building up organizations like the Writers, uh, Writers Trust, the um, Writers Union, the Penn Canada. She, realized that we needed a we needed structures for writers uh, where we could all join together we could all understand each other's um, what we were doing and it's made a huge difference to the way writers can operate in this country but also to way Cana the way Canadians can now read about our country hmm. she had a great fight with Doug Ford too over libraries remember that one I love it <laughs> okay uh, from the first lady of um literature, if we can put it that way, to the first lady of the justice system. Bertha Wilson was our first female Supreme Court judge, and I bet you not one in Canadian in a hundred can name them. Actually, you know, she and um, Harold Innes are the two people in the book that people mm. kept saying, who? Yeah. 
Bertha Wilson was crucial because, in fact, when you ask Canadians today what's important about this country, almost inevitably the two first things they say are Medicare and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Charter of Rights and Feed Freedoms was very much um, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's baby, but it could have just been, you know, sort of a lot of words that nobody really understood what relevance they had to everyday lives. Bertha Wilson was on the Supreme Court when the first test cases for the Charter of Freedom, Rights and Freedoms came into the justice system and came, reached the Supreme Court. And she stuck up for the underdog every single time. She put real muscle into the Charter. And I think she's played a huge role in giving Canadians the sense of security that they can never be oppressed by government. Hmm. Is it fair to say that she did such a good job that that helped usher in us towards what is almost a 50-50 court in terms of gender? Oh, yes. She was, very, she was the first woman on the Supreme Court, although she never saw herself as a feminist. But she spoke very much from her particular perspective, which, of course, was a woman's perspective. So she was also crucial on issues like the Morgenthaler abortion debate. Mm -hmm. And she told her colleagues, you know, look, you can't even imagine what it's like to be a woman who's pregnant and uh, feeling completely helpless and doesn't want the baby. Hmm. Um, I guess in terms of whom to pick representing the indigenous history of the country, there are any number of different options you could have selected. You went with Elijah Harper. How come? It was very hard to find somebody who really told the whole story of um, the very unhappy history of indigenous peoples in this country since Confederation. But there's one person who so many Canadians recognize the image, and, and that's Elijah Harper holding the eagle feather as he basically sabotaged the um, Meech Lake Accord, uh, which was a constitutional deal from which the indigenous peoples had been completely cut out, marginalized. Mm -hmm. But the other reason I chose him, not just because of that very important step that he took back in uh, 1990, but also because his life story is the life story of so many um, indigenous peoples, of beginning on a reserve, tremendous uh, hardship, going to residential school, sexual abuse, and then coming out, coming and just quite gently forcing his voice into the mainstream. It's, it's amazing that he will be forever remembered as a man with a one-word quote, you know? No. No. Yeah. It's just no. This isn't going forward unless you deal with indigenous issues. And since that date, you know, I mean, some of the stories aren't always the best stories, but we have paid a lot more attention to indig indigenous issues. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, you've got a politician on your list. Uh, but an interesting choice, I have to say, because he was never a premier, he was never a prime minister, he was never a cabinet minister, he was only ever in opposition. He's a very fine man, though, Preston Manning. Preston Manning. I included because I really wanted two things. I wanted that voice from the West, which he really represented. But he was always committed to Canada. It was never a breakaway movement, uh, his, the Reform Party. But I also felt that he represents something that's been incredibly important in the last 150 years, which is rolling waves of populist movements. And I can tell you, honestly, it was really interesting writing about him as we were watching what was happening in the States with, first of all, the Tea Party and then with the Trump movement, because it's so different, the populis populism in the States against populism in Canada. He, Preston Manning took really great care to make sure that what he was arguing for was not against any particular group, mm -hmm. but although he was not sympathetic to Quebec, but he really, he wanted to make one simple point, the West wants in. And so he was, he was remarkably Canadian in terms of his tenacity, but also the care with which he tried to make it inclusive. I'm not sure you ever heard him use expressions like, we got to go to Ottawa to drain the swamp. Never. Right? No, I mean, he, that, that <laughs> although, was not his way. Although Ottawa was never his favorite place. No, that's fair enough to say. Here's uh, Douglas Copeland, quoted in your book as having said the following, Canada is a country that's basically brand new. We haven't had much chance to really establish who we are, what we are. 
In terms of the American experience, we're where they were in about 1911. Growing up, we always had this strange sensation that we were just one lap dance away from morphing into the U.S., and it was a very scary feeling. That's a very funny quote. We often get defined in Canada as being not them, right? We're not the Americans. But Douglas seems to be saying that because of our proximity to them and our being inundated by their culture all the time, we're vulnerable to that phenomenon happening here. Do you think he's right about that? I think he probably was when perhaps when, you know, he says growing up, that's how he felt. I don't think Canadians feel that now at all. And, you know, I'm very conscious that I have people of my generation in Canada have one view of sort of being Canadian, which often is defined as opposed to being American. But I see my kids who are now in their 30s and the way they think of being Canadian. They just take it as a given that this is a completely different country. And when you say to them, so what's special about being Canadian, none of them would ever say, well, it's not being Amer it's being not American. Hmm. That's the last thing that they would come up, come up with. What would they say? I think they'd have a combination of, uh, they're all men, uh, extreme sports, hockey, in tremendous respect for people from other cultures. I mean, their, their, their peer group is so from so many different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, they just see Canada as a, a great place to live. We have never felt the need to beat our chest the way Americans do. You don't hear... It's different, right? Do you well, know one why? Of the, one of the great quotes uh, actually is from Peter C. Newman, which is, Canada's the only country who's, which, the ambition of which has been to be Clark Kent rather than Superman. <laughs> yeah, and, um, well, this is a country that's built on accommodation. There have always been sort of more than one group here. There's never been a mainstream. You know, there is no single definition of being Canadian. So we've had to accommodate different peoples. We've had to sort of mute the dialogue so that we're not uh, at each other's throats. And that means, in fact, playing it softer, playing it just, you know, not too aggressively because we understand that uh, we have to share this country and we don't necessarily share language, race, religion, but we share the country, so we just better get on with it. In the epilogue of the book, you talk about the CBC broadcaster and musician, Shad, and what he symbolizes. Um, Two-part question here. Tell everybody who Shad is for those who don't listen to Q or didn't listen to Q when he was on it. And what do you think he symbolizes? Well, Shad is a fabulous uh, musician and uh, art, uh, music artist who uh, was, is a C still is a CBC host. And I loved it when I spoke to him because um, he, uh, he's very soft-spoken and he's very smart. He came here as a refugee. Um, with his parents from Rwanda. And he talked about his experiences growing up, uh, where he and his sister were the only non-white kids in the school. Gradually, though, more and more Africans came, and eventually he had more uncles and aunties than anybody else in the community. Um, but what I found really interesting about Chad was that he felt deeply Canadian and proud of Canada being, you know, he said, it, Canada remains an experiment. You know, we're still going forward. But he's also pretty critical. You know, he said that um, this is a country which uh, prides itself on its tolerance. But tolerance isn't enough. We've got to move beyond that. We've got to be more proactive. Mm. So what I really liked about Chad was that he was somebody who was not anybody who looked like he could have been descended from one of the fathers of Confederation. On the other hand, he feels totally belong he belongs here but he said, it's not enough. We've got to keep moving. So he really, to go back to what I said at the beginning, each generation reinvents this country and he's part of the next generation. Mm. I wasn't looking for wildly successful chess beating heroes who mm. sort of went out to drums and cymbals. I was looking for people who either helped develop the national psyche or symbolize something really important in it. And I think each of the people I spoke I, I wrote about represents something very important about Canada. They'd all thought about Canada a lot. They'd all decided there was something, some frontier that they wanted to move forward in some way, some idea they wanted to push into the mainstream. What happened to them personally was often, you know, 
not necessarily uh, that they were acclaimed at the time for their contribution, but I think they've all changed the country. For the better. For the better. Uh, as do you with your books. I always love reading your stuff. The Promise of Canada, 150 years, people and ideas that have shaped our country, as Charlotte Gray has also done. Thanks, Charlotte. Great to see you again. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.